Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the product design engineer director of Facebook Oculus, Miss Caitlin Kalinowski. Hello, I am so happy to be here with you in Silicon Slopes and in Utah. When I joined Oculus in 2014, my team was sweating on a huge challenge. We had to design the controllers that went with the hotly anticipated Oculus Rift virtual reality headset. At the time, VR was uncharted territory. There was little precedence for what hardware should look or feel like. Working with designers led by the industrial design lead, Peter Bristol, our team began weighing factors that would determine how the product would ultimately look and feel. We wanted our controllers to fit a broad range of hand sizes and shapes, from the 5th percentile female to the 95th percentile male. Look, you had to grip the controller without interfering with the connection between the infrared LEDs on the ring and an external sensor. And remember, you can't see the controllers when you're in VR. Each new parameter complicated the next. The overall weight, the number of buttons, the strap, how you'd hold it. Our team iterated over and over again. This is where the magic happened. Some prototypes were so ugly, they were literally a piece of plastic with putty stuck on them. But by the end, we'd created a controller that a user could open and close her hand on in gameplay without dropping, and sensors that allowed users to naturally give thumbs up or to point when they're playing games. We had iterated enough times that when we reached the engineering validation build, the middle of our process, the physical proportions of the controller were nearly perfect. So the craft of prototyping can be boiled down into six principles that you can use and apply when making any product. Now, this works for hardware, but it also works for software and a combination of both. Many of you make products, and you know this. There is a moment before you start building your product when your deadlines are not yet set. The stakeholders are still patient and your customers aren't yet clamoring. Use this moment to get very clear about which goals you won't bend or budge on. Before starting design work, decide what your product absolutely must do before you'll ship it. Define your non-negotiables. While the Oculus Touch controllers are my most recent project with my team, my first product was the OQO Model 2. Do any of you guys remember this? OK, there's a reason for that. <laughs> New companies are often under a lot of pressure. They don't always define their non-negotiables very well. And sometimes they can be forced to ship early or for the wrong reasons without having met those critical benchmarks. Like the OQO, we delayed shipment for the wrong reasons. So you have to boil the elements, the most critical elements of a product, down to one or two key features. If you don't nail those, you're not going to ship the product. Steve Jobs had the idea for a lightweight book. And he wanted this lightweight book to be light because he knew that it was the most critical product feature. When you think about a book, if your hands get tired, you can't actually engage with your content. So the engineers at Apple in the early 2000s kept bringing Steve a prototype every year over and over and over again. The problem was that no matter what they did, they couldn't get the weight down far enough. Now, in the middle of the development of iPad, right in the center of that development, they came up with the iPhone, and they shipped the iPhone. And then they went back and worked on the iPad over and over and over until it actually shipped. Now, coming back to the OQO, we miniaturized this PC into a tiny product that fit on your hand 
when laptops were so big and bulky. It ran a full version of Windows. In a lot of ways, it was before its time, with a full keyboard, broadband, and a weight of less than one pound. But there are a few perfectionists at our company, and some things weren't quite right. We kept redesigning and redesigning. And actually, that housing right there, we went through 100 iterations. Now, the Model 2 eventually came out in April 2007. Does anybody else remember what came out around that time? That's right. It was the iPhone. We shipped this product three months after Apple's iPhone was announced. We'd missed our ship window with a product battery life that lasted less than an hour. Now, new companies are often under a lot of pressure. They don't always clearly define their non-negotiables at the beginning. Let's go back to the iPad. Steve Jobs knew to wait for the wait to be right to ship it. My next rule is let the product drive your development style. There are two main things to consider here, speed and caution. And you can't have both. Which way you tilt in development will depend on your company, what you're trying to accomplish, and where you are in your development cycle. If you're schedule driven and trying to beat a competitor to market, slide away from caution. If you're making a product with a lower volume in hardware, 100 of something versus 2 million, you can spend a little less time iterating and be more aggressive. At Apple, developing the MacBook Air, I'm going to be far more cautious about risk because it's a huge, high volume product. It's really expensive to recover from mistakes in those cases. If I'm designing the first VR product, I'm going to use less caution and be more ambitious because my volumes will be manageable. I can move faster and fix problems in flight. You have to understand where you are in order to master these trade-offs. If I'm making a medical product, my caution slider is generally all the way to the left. Those products take longer to develop and achieve compliance. Your management of your team should also shift accordingly. If you're super cautious, encourage all assumptions to be checked and double-checked. Tell your teammates to confront each other. Ask, is this true? Is there enough swell space for the battery? Is the flame rating correct on this part? Are you sure? Have we tested it? Have we checked that the manufacturer hasn't changed the material on us to lower costs mid-flight? When speed is the top concern, only worry about the most critical issues. In these cases, I give a piece of paper to my team and I say, make a list of all the design issues you're worried about in ranked order. Then I rip the page under their first five and hand the top part back to them. Say, just focus on those. When you do that, their eyes will bug out of their head, but they will definitely thank you later. Once you've figured out your place on this speed caution slider, you're ready to start building prototypes. Your singular goal is to iterate as much as possible before the ship date. Solve the hardest problems first. Trust me, if you take a typical engineer, show them a problem and say, I don't know if this can be done, they're usually all in. My former colleague, Doug Field, who was my VP at Apple and now runs engineering at Tesla, had a very useful way to think about design effort. So on the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is the amount of work you're putting in. Most people follow the red line when they're making products. They increase their effort and focus as the product develops. And then the effort peaks the moment right before you ship. And that's where you find a lot of the issues you need to fix. But making changes at the end of the development cycle is much more difficult and dangerous and costly than it is in the beginning. You don't have much ability to make big changes after EVT in hardware that's really the middle of our process without causing risk. Focus your effort towards the beginning on the green curve, where you can squeeze in as many iterations as possible and changes. The risk is lower. Grow through crazy amounts of work right here. Put the best people on it. Do all of your grinding early. Take one thing at a time with your prototypes. Begin with the gnarliest challenge. This seems really simple, but actually people almost never do it. Dedicate the most time to the hardest thing, 
and start to layer in easier things as you go with your prototypes. What are you doing that nobody else has actually done before? This is the thing that you're not even sure you can do at all. That's where you want to fix and fixate your initial prototyping energy. And you'll also be revving up your engineers by giving them a meaty problem to solve. Build ugly prototypes. I mean seriously ugly prototypes. Your early iterations should be hideous. You're focusing on the toughest engineering problems first. You don't need to worry about how it looks yet. But there's also a hidden benefit. When something is ugly, people are less likely to fall in love with it, especially influential people inside a company. Have you ever shown somebody an idea that was pretty, but you wanted to change your mind later, and they came back and asked about it over and over again? This is why we keep things ugly. If you show people something physical, especially, they can lock onto it. Don't give people anything to anchor to until you're ready. Polish when you're actually selling something. This is a strategy for guarding the product's potential. Keep your prototypes and early ideas ugly longer. Braid in other things as you progress. You don't need to do everything at once. With the touch controllers, this is how we did it. We first looked at the shape of the handle and the shape of the ring that had to be tracked. Inside this ring is a infrared sensors that are firing. You can't see them. And a sensor on the outside that has to actually read where your hands are. What we did is start with the shape. How do you hold it? How do you open your hand? Can you give a thumbs up? Can you point? Once that was pretty close, we moved into other, other parts around input. We had a whole other set of prototypes with buttons and sensors and triggers that were not form factor over here. The electrical innards and sensors were split off into their own set of prototypes. When we got far enough along, we actually braided the two sets of prototypes together in our first integration build, proving that everything could fit in the final package size. This is the result of probably two and a half years of prototyping efforts um, over many teams. Converge quickly or reset. This principle is really important because it's actually one of the ways you can know you're on the wrong track and you're wasting time and energy. This keeps you from following the wrong path for too long, but it also has to do with listening to your team. Too much prototyping can actually be a bad thing. On this slide, you have the number of attempts across the x-axis. And on the y-axis, it's how close are you getting to your goal. You can actually sense when you're on the wrong track when iterations start to yield tiny incremental improvements and you aren't converging towards your goal. You need to either change your goal or change your assumptions. You may be solving the wrong problem. Scrap the plan, back up, and find a different way to solve the problem. If you wait too long to rip off the Band-Aid, it can get so expensive that you actually lose your chance to reset. For the Mac Pro, we actually struggled to get the extrusion right. When I was at Apple, on the left, what you can see is uh, an actually impact extruded part on the right and an extruded part on the left that makes up the housing. And inside the computer, I don't know if you folks have seen this online or looked at this product, but inside there's actually a heat sink that's also extruded in the center of this product. And there's two GPUs and a CPU all attached to the heat sink, and it sinks all that heat. And what the industrial designers at Apple wanted to do on the left side was to get the housing and the heat sink all extruded from one piece of aluminum. But it was actually too hard. We ended up cutting it into two pieces, the housing and the inner triangle, and bolting them together. We went so far down the path of trying to get the extrusion right, but the manufacturing method couldn't handle the complexity of the part. That's when Matt Casepolt made the call to stop. We all wanted to make the Apple ID team happy. But at a certain point, if you're not converging, you need to make that call. Too little prototyping can also be a bad thing. So if you don't go far enough, even if you're on the right track, down the number of iterations, 
your engineers will start to get really uneasy. It's usually a big warning sign that they feel like you're moving too fast. Encourage your team to tell you bad news by improving your response to bad news. Be sure to actually do something about it. It often means connecting people or calling a meeting and making it known you'll do everything you can to support your team in fixing the problem. You want to spend just the right amount of time prototyping because engineers, we never feel like the product's actually done. Team leaders can be OK with shipping a few minor issues, but we as engineers really struggle with it. My advice, to tell them we'll get it right on the follow-on product, that we care, we want to get it right, but this product needs to go out now. Because with hardware, when we ship, we're done. Worst case scenario, we can roll a fix after ramp when the big buildup of product has been sold through. Now, ending your iterations really close to your ship date is very dangerous because of all the interdependencies, especially with hardware. Before you make any changes, be sure you visit your non-negotiable list and prioritize. Otherwise, you could be slowing down for the wrong reasons. So can you guys think of a product in your life that you truly love? I want you to think about that product as I go through this next, uh, this next example, which is iterate like crazy. And this is how you get from good to great, even if everything else is done perfectly, because you can have everything right on paper for a product. You can have the right price. You can have the right features. You can have the right ship date. But if you miss things like click feel, or texture, or sound, or flow, the minutia that gives the experience of that glow, you can rob yourself of the chance of shipping products that people love. If you don't iterate really, really tightly on the parts customers interact with the most, you could miss the opportunity of a lifetime. So let's talk about the trackpad on the MacBook or the MacBook Pro. Have, have any of you guys had a MacBook? Okay, that was one of my products at one point. Have you ever switched from a MacBook to another computer and noticed the trackpad? Okay, people are laughing because um, if it's too glossy, a trackpad, your finger kind of slips over it. And if it's too rough, you really notice. Apple knew to spend extra time on the part that the customer touches the most. It took many, many iterations it's a glass etch, actually, to get the surface to feel right. You need just the right amount of friction. My example of this, a product that I love, is actually when you step on a train from the airport in Zurich and you're headed downtown. The train is so quiet and stable, it just whisks you away. And it took people so much work to make that train quiet and stable and smooth but they knew to value those pieces as part of your experience. And it makes coming around the bend when the city comes into view, the mountains behind it, that much more impressive. The commitment to this holistic experience, the level of iteration it takes to get it right, make all the difference. These are the things that contribute to the synesthetic feel of the experience. These are the things that make you fall in love with a product. Make sure you give yourself time to get them right. Now, a lot of people know these rules. These are not mine alone. I'm here to tell you, though, far too many people know about them, but they don't actually apply them rigorously. You have to apply them. And if all else fails, go back to where you started. Why are you building this product? And who is it for? Stay focused on user experience. And finally, and this is critical, prototyping is supposed to be fun. If it's not fun, you're doing it wrong. Free your engineers to come up with things. There should be a grand excess of cool ideas. After you've popped the champagne to celebrate your successful ship, you can pick up the next great product from your cutting room floor. I want to thank Nate, Silicon Slopes, for having me here today, and to all of you. Also to Oculus and Facebook for allowing me to do what I love so much. And a special thank you to First Round Review for sharing my rules of prototyping in an article earlier this year. There's some more information there if you'd like to check it out. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for Caitlin. Caitlin, thank you very much. All right.